Okay, thank you all for coming for the second feature. Today we have uh, the lieutenant now, Lieutenant John Kidd. And uh, John has a very impressive resume so far. So the future is just going higher than this. He started his uh, hydrographic career at the Atlantic Hydrographic Branch in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, in addition, he did his bachelor's at uh, Old Dominion University in uh, Norfolk. Yep. Norfolk graduated from Ocean, Earth, and Atmosphere uh, in 2011. From then, he's been hopping on almost all the North Fleet, the, the OCS fleet at least, the Rainier, TJ, uh, Fairweather. And not the Fairweather. No, I'll leave it One day. Okay, <laughs> one day. Doesn't, doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't count. <laughs> and joined CECOM uh, as a master's student in 2015. Now we're going to see his defense. And after uh, he finished his master's, he already has put uh, well, he already been assigned to become the ops officer on the Haslam. Uh, but as, as we know, things can be changed, but <laughs> hopefully, no. If, no, it's final. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Without with, with further ado, John will present his research on performance evaluation using a terrestrial laser scanner, specifically Velodyne DLP-16. <coughs> On the ability to detect surface features. Do you want to explain the timing again, or? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Same. Uh, we're going to have 40 minutes presentation. Where, unless there's a clarification question, we'll move for the presentation. Then we'll have a 20 minute uh, session where first the committee will ask questions. After that, it'll be open to the general public to ask questions. And after that, we have our private session where we ask a few more fun questions. At the end, the decision is made. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It's a, actually a pretty impressive showing. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about a performance evaluation of the Velodyne VLP-16 system, which is a terrestrial laser scanner. And uh, we're going to be using it for Muted. Uh, surface feature uh, surveying. So first up, uh, wanted to go through an outline real quick. We're going to be talking about, I'm going to go through an introduction of what is surface feature surveying and give a background. Uh, then we're going to talk about a technology overview, what are terrestrial laser scanners, how they work, and then go right into an instrument characterization of the system. Uh, talk about an in internal reference frame validation, um, characterizing the uncertainty with those, that angular separation. <laughs> also looking at the uncertainty of the, the range estimates for the scanner, and we'll also looking at a data density evaluation. And then we'll look at some uh, field data that I collected this past summer and end with a couple discussion points. So first up, what is surface feature surveying? In the NOAA world, we call it shoreline survey, and that's a simple definition we could use as mapping of the features at the intersection of the land-water interface. So here's a chart of uh, southern Maine here. This is the approach to Portsmouth Harbor. And you can see a lot of complexity in this area. There's a lot of different feature types. There's, there's islands. Uh, there's little islets out here, rocks that are above the surface, below the surface. There's some pile points out here, there's even a pier. So there's a lot of things that need to be mapped in this area. So who conducts shoreline survey? Uh, the National Geodetic Survey Remote Sensing Division uh, conducts the initial surveys and captures the information about most of the majority of the main features here, like the contiguous shoreline here. Uh, which is mapped to mean high water and uh, most of the major items here. But uh, after that, our Office of Coast Survey field units, uh, they conduct shoreline verification surveys where they go out and, and look to verify, disprove, or even find new features that are out there. So how do we conduct shoreline survey? Uh, the remote sensing division uses these two remote sensing uh, techniques, airborne light arbitrometry, which we heard about this morning, and also photogrammetry. Uh, these are aircraft-based uh, remote sensing techniques. Uh, what about the Office of Coast Survey? So I'm going to be referring to their current methods that they use as traditional shoreline survey. 
which kind of looks something like this. It's uh, these hydrographers are perched on a rock using an alidade and plane table, and they first position themselves on the earth and then position the item of interest or the target of interest. Now, today we obviously have the use of GPS and computers to help us, but we're still taking discrete measurements on these targets by using magnetic compasses and laser range finders to get a relative horizontal positioning, which will correlate to the GPS position. And also for the vertical positioning, sometimes we're using visual estimation. So, um, and we're using pencil and paper to notate all this uh, information down and also the, the GPS uh, cookie trail, if you will. So what standards are we serving to? For that, we look at the International Hydrographic Organization Standard 44, uh, Standards for Hydrographic Surveys. And for surveying the coastline, we're obviously going to be in very shallow water, so we're only dealing with special order and order 1A surveys. Uh, for the horizontal positioning, we're looking at, uh, for Topography significant to navigation, the positioning needs to be better than uh, two meters is what we're shooting for horizontally. But vertically speaking, to, to be able to determine if the feature is above the water or below the water at the tide datum, uh, mean low, low water, we're going to be looking at uh, total vertical uncertainty. Um, here's the equation we use to determine the standards for that where the, this depth dependent factors are zeroed out, right, because we're surveying features at the surface. So we're looking only at the A here, which is quarter meter plus or minus for special order surveys and plus or minus half meter for order 1A surveys. So what has NOAA been doing to try to improve on these traditional shoreline uh, methods? So over the past decade, we've been looking at uh, using mobile laser scanners to, to improve these, these practices. Um, in 2008, Captain Rick Brennan, the gentleman in front of the room, kind of started this off. Uh, he looked at the Regal LMS system here. Here's the data set from that study. And 2012, Katrina Wiley, a PS, a physical scientist that just graduated from UNH a couple years ago, she used the Trimble Landmark system. Here's the data set from that study. And in the conclusion of those studies, they basically found that using laser scanners compared to traditional methods, it took a lot less time to complete those surveys. Uh, the data was accurate. Um, they actually found a lot more features out there. Um, it was safer because you're, you're collecting the information on these targets from a safe distance. It's a remote sensing technique. Uh, but they also saw that it was, it was very cost prohibitive using these survey grade laser scanners which costs anywhere from fifty to $200,000. So recently, a new class of uh, laser scanners has come available on the market, industrial grade laser scanners. Um, in 2015, VTAD Pradith, in collaboration with uh, CECOM and NOAA, looked at the HDL32 system here on the left. This scanner has 32 different lasers, which rotate 360 degrees, and they were able to successfully integrate it onto a survey platform and uh, also create a, a driver, high pack driver, so to be able to integrate it with our acquisition system. Um, for my study, I'm looking at the VLP-16, the guy on the right here. Uh, we chose this sensor because of its, its uh, lower cost than compared to the HDL-32. Um, also, it's, it's small size and also the, the weather resistant capabilities it has. I'll talk about this in the, the next couple slides. To do a comparison of these two different scanner types, survey versus industrial, I picked the original two survey grade scanners that we looked at previously and also the two industrial grade scanners. And just, just to clarify things, the survey grade laser scanners are designed to complete surveys of, to high precision, to, to map things with high precision um, to create a 3D point cloud. These industrial grade scanners were created essentially for uh, specifically these Velodyne sensors for the automotive industry for um, target detection and avoidance. So we're, we're intending to use them for, for something that, that they weren't initially intended to be used for. But to go down these different categories, we can see that the industrials are much more inexpensive uh, the survey grade ones have a lot farther ranges. Uh, accuracies are actually about in the same playing field, 
the data output for these industrial grade scanners are a lot higher compared to the survey grade. That's because they use a little bit more inexpensive uh, laser elements in them, so they can stack a lot, a lot of the elements inside. They're all working in the infrared, um, infrared spectrum. Uh, beam divergences are usually a lot smaller for survey grade scanners, so you'll get a smaller footprint out at, at uh, farther ranges, and they're all class one um, I safe. So my goal in this study is to evaluate the use of a low-cost industrial grade mobile laser scanner if, if it can be used for completing shoreline surveys with performance that can meet survey requirements for charting purposes. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. And to do that, I conducted several experiments in a well-controlled environment to, to uh, conduct an instrument characterization and also to verify the specifications from, from the manufacturer, Velodyne. And to do that, I used the Chase Ocean Engineering Wave Tow Tank just on the other side of this wall here. Uh, it's a 36 meter long tank with a, a tow carriage mounted on top that can be positioned along this rail here with millimeter accuracy. So that kind of functioned as our control for the reference frames. Um, the instrument characterization uh, we've looked at, like I said in the introduction, was the angular separation between each beam uh, and also the range uncertainty and a data density evaluation. And after we conduct the instrument characterization, we mounted it on the research vessel Gulf Surveyor here, UNH's new boat, and collected the data set this past summer in Portsmouth Harbor. And we'll look at um, the data set from that at the end of the show, uh, the PowerPoint. So to go through a technology overview, uh, terrestrial laser scanners come in all different shapes and sizes with laser, different laser characteristics, uh, different frequencies and pulse repetition rates. But um, I'm going to be talking about all these, uh, the technology overview as it relates to the VLP-16. Um, so all terrestrial laser scanners have these three components here. And uh, for the VLP-16, this is what their laser ranging unit looks like. It's uh, it's a ceramic hybrid board with on one side they have the emitter uh, electronics and the other side is the detector. The optomechanical scanning device is actually just a mechanical scanning device. These laser uh, elements are stacked on a center rotating stave and they rotate 360 degrees like this. Um, so there's no optical component like another terrestrial laser scanners. They don't have rotating mirrors. It's just purely mechanical. And the control and data sampling unit is this Velodyne interface box, which is connected to the scanner by a three meter cable. So just like laser range finders, uh, these, the terrestrial laser scanners uh, use a two way travel time to calculate the range to a target. Um, uh, for these scanners, they're using the near in the lasers that are in the near infrared spectrum, so 903 nanometers. Uh, and again, they're using two-way travel time. So by multiplying the uh, time of time interval elapsed by the speed of sound and and uh, speed of light in air, which is about 300,000 kilometers per second, you can calculate the range. But for the terrestrial laser scanners, uh, the VLP-16 has 16 laser beams that are spread uh, within a plus or minus 15 degree vertical field of view, and they rotate 360 degrees to give, give you a nice 3D um, point cloud. Um, the angular separation between each beam is two degrees, shown in here. Um, the accuracy in the the user manual is stated as plus or minus three centimeters, typically. Um, it's IP67 rated environmental protection, which is an ingress protection, meaning that basically it's protected against dust and it's splash proof. Um, with a firing sequence of 18.2 kilohertz per each laser, we get about 300,000 data points per second. Uh, question I get often is, is it eye safe? Is it safe to look at? And yes, it's class one eye safe, so you can look at it with the naked eye and even um, standard magnifying optics like binoculars. Uh, the laser itself is 903 nanometers, so we're not going to get any kind of water penetration which is fine for us. We're not looking to, to measure the depth of the water. We're only getting information above the water surface, so surface features. Uh, the beam divergence for this laser is three milliradians, which at its maximum range of 100 meters, 
represents a beam diameter of about 30 centimeters. Uh, so how does all the parts fit together on, on the mobile uh, survey platform? So just like our echo sounders, the laser scanner needs to be told where it is on the Earth's surface at all times and also at what precise direction it's pointed. So the roll, roll pitch yaw um, directions that it's pointed. So by using the GNSS positions and timestamps with the IMU accelerations and rotations and the scanners uh, measured ranges, angles, um, pair all that together, you get the final geolocated um, location of the target of interest. Uh, so this is an image uh, modified from Amin Habib uh, representing the laser scanner geolocation equation down here at the bottom. So the end goal here is to calculate the vector from the mapping frame to the target, which is this vector x sub g, which is calculated by summing together these three vectors here, which x sub zero is the position of the, the vessel the GPS position of the vessel represented at the IMU body frame. Uh, P sub G is the sensor offset measured before the survey from the IMU to the scanner. And this row vector here is the range from the scanner to the target. Now you also need to have the rotations for each of these reference frames. So the R sub yaw pitch roll is the angular offsets or the angular uh, displacements measured by the IMU. The R sub delta omega delta P delta kappa is the boresight calibration angles between the IMU body and the laser, laser scanner body. And finally, the R sub alpha beta is the azimuth and elevation angles measured by the laser scanner. So my first Instrument characterization experiment we conducted was to verify the two degree elevation angle separation between each beam. Again, this is from the Velodyne user manual. They have it typically two degree separation. So we were interested to see uh, how accurate were those mounting angles. They don't publish any uncertainty values to this, this uh, metric. And also to see if that spacing is, in, is indeed uniform throughout the field of view. And this is important to know because this is a direct component of this geolocation equation. This beta here represents this angle, which if this is wrong, it's going to propagate all the way down to uh, an error to the, the, the coordinate of the, of the target. So to look at this, uh, we used the wave tow tank. Um, we mounted the scanner vertically. So throughout all my experiments, I'm usually mounting the scanner vertically, but just to be clear, when I say azimuth and elevation angles, I'm talking about how Velodyne uses them. So the azimuth angles here is the rotation 360 degrees up and down, and the elevation angles is the separation of the beams left and right here. So the scanner was mounted vertically above a high precision rotating compass, accurate to about four hundredths of a degree, which was mounted on top of a level tripod at the edge of the tow tank. The target we chose was a narrow strip of aluminum, uh, which is highly reflective, and we positioned it at around eight meters, which the laser beam footprint at that range correspond to the width of that target. So the idea was we were going to mechanically calibrate the scanner by rotating it back and forth across this target and, and take measurements of, of the data that are just within the specular area of this target and look at the intensities. So when the laser was perfectly aligned with the target, we would see the highest intensity, the peak intensity, which is interpreted to be that the laser scanner target is perfectly aligned. So here is a, a plot of one specific setup that we had. We, we had to do this in four different setups. Um, this is centered around the minus 11 degree beam here and on the y-axis we have intensity. So each data point here is the average intensity for that setup. And as you can see, the data points make nice distinct peaks um, at specific angles. And as you can see, minus nine and minus seven degree, we're registering uh, some offsets here. So the, the cumulative offsets we have from the minus 15 degree working right are represented in this plot with the angular offsets on the y-axis. As you can see, the at, at the minus five degree beam, 
we measured an um, offset of about a tenth of a degree. So that was the worst case scenario that we had. Taking this worst case scenario of a tenth of a degree offset and a, the maximum range of 100 meters, that represented a horizontal offset of 17, about 17 and a half centimeters. So we have a rock out here at the maximum range of 100 meters. Uh, an error due to the tenth, uh, tenth of a degree error that would cause a, a horizontal error of about 17 and a half centimeters, which is still well within the two meter requirement. Uh, we also wanted to characterize the uncertainty with those elevation angles. So to do that, we, we looked at the spread of the, the elevation angles, this, this beta angle here. So to, to assess that, we used this simple um, trick, uh, equation here. We had the Z coordinates of all the data, and the R was known for that experiment. It was, it was static, so we took the mean of that. And to re, uh, we um, rearranged the equation, so we had inverse sine of the Z, which is the coordinates of the, uh, the, the points on the target over the, the range. And this is the, the spread of the elevation angles that we got for each beam which on average was about 600th of a degree. So that was the uncertainty with those, those uh, elevation angles that we had, which again, out at a maximum range of 100 meters, taking the worst case scenario, uh, if it was a 600th of a degree off, that represented a, a horizontal error of about 10 and a half centimeters. So adding that to our previous 10th uh, of a degree error, uh, we, we get a horizontal uncertainty of uh, error of 28 centimeters, still well within the IHO spec of two meters. Next, we wanted to verify the, the range uncertainty for, for the scanner. Again, back to the user manual, they, they state that it's typically plus or minus three centimeters. Um, we wanted to do this as a function of, of range to the target, uh, the, the incident angle of the target, so from what angle you're scanning the target from, and also the nature of the target. It, was it rough? Is it smooth? Um, so to, uh, we, we chose these four different targets because uh, they covered a wide range of uh, superficial roughnesses. Uh, from left to right, we had whiteboard, which was analogous to like a, a, a freshly painted surface or a metal buoy, something that was highly reflective. Um, a wooden target, to represent like a wooden piling or a wooden pier. A concrete for a concrete pier or other structure, and then sand for a sandy beach. Um, these we wanted to characterize the range uncertainty on these targets to make sure that the scanner was performing uniformly across all these different target types. So again, we're back in the wave uh, tow tank, except this time we're using the the tow platform to adjust the range of the target. Um, so we mounted the scanner vertically directly to the uh, tripod at the edge of the tow tank, and the target is now on the, the, um, the platform, which again, we're, we're adjusting the range. Below the target, we mounted a rotating compass so we could adjust the target left and right to adjust the incident angle of the, the laser beams as they intersect. But here's the ranges that we used and uh, the incident angles that we use. And at 75 degrees incident angle at the maximum range of the tow tank, the footprint of the laser beam was still on, on the target, so we didn't have any edge effects. So the alignment procedure, we basically use like a ranging technique like a mariner uses to navigate down a channel. We compare the real-time horizontal coordinate of the target we got from the scanner. We compared that value to the computed horizontal, uh, horizontal um, location of the target. And if those didn't match, we knew that the, the scanner target pair weren't aligned very well, so we adjusted until those values matched. So here, here are some of the plots that we were generating from this experiment. Um, these are for the wooden target. And as uh, we click through, we're going to be increasing the in, uh, incident angle. And this is a range at five meters. The data points here are individual uh, points on the target from the laser scanner and they are colored by intensity. So I'm gonna start this animation and as it goes through, you can see as we increase the incident angle, the intensities are getting smaller and smaller. That's due to the, most of the laser light being force scattered and less of the light coming back to the actual sensor. You can also see that the target appears to be getting uh, closer to the scanner. So the scanner is here to the left. 
this is a side view of the target. Um, the target seems to be getting closer to the scanner. That's because as you increase the uh, incident angle, the beam footprint is intersecting the target at a closer and closer range. So to look at the spread of this data here, um, here are four different plots. Uh, this is for the whiteboard target, wooden target, concrete target, and sand. So we're increasing uh, superficial roughness this way. Um, each colored curve is represented by a different incident angle that the, the target was at. We have range on the X and the two sigma confidence intervals of the spread in, in the range direction on the Y axis. As you can see, the, there's kind of an inverse relationship between superficial roughness and the two sigma confidence intervals. So the sand target, it was ranging, um, the performance was really well. Uh, for this white whiteboard target at the furthest range and highest uh, incident angle, it actually performed relatively poorly. But averaging all these data points at the maximum range of the tow tank of about 30 meters, um, we get a, a two sigma confidence interval average of uh, plus or minus one and a half centimeters, which is well below the about half the, the specifications. Because of the, the tow tank was only 30 meters long, uh, we couldn't actually test the scanner at its maximum range. But uh, just out of curiosity, we uh, generated lines of best fits for all these curves and extrapolated out to 100 meters, averaged those data points all the way out 100 meters, and we resolved exactly at the plus or minus 3.0 centimeter confidence interval. So that matched the specifications. Now that experiment was only done for one laser beam, but as a sanity check, we, we conducted an abbreviated uh, experiment verifying all the other laser beams. So we have minus 15 all the way out to 15 here. Um, we did this only on one target, the aluminum target, at one range and one incident angle, a normal incident angle. And we uh, found that all the other laser beams were performing as expected also, well below the uh, plus or minus three, three centimeter advertised accuracies. So next we have uh, data density potential. So the user manual for the VLP16 has it represented in the time domain. So about 300,000 points per second, which was a little difficult to interpret because I'm used to thinking about things in the spatial domain, you know, like five pings per sounding to, to populate a node. So we were curious to see if it, what kind of uh, data density we could get from the sensor, five points per square meter, 5,000 points per square meter, as you imagine, there's a, there's a lot of different factors that you have to consider when, when trying to understand this. Uh, this is a, a laser scanner simulator that Dr. Ferrant Aaron helped me um, uh, create to mimic the physical characteristics of the scanner. So we're accounting for uh, the beam, the, the laser scanner had 16 beams. We're accounting for pulse repetition rates, scanning frequencies, uh, mounting angles of the scanner. So if you mount the scanner to scan horizontally, the beams that are at the horizon are gonna make vertical stripes of data as the boat moves along. So if your one, one meter square box is in between those two beams, you're not gonna get any data within that box. But is a straight up vertical, uh, vertical mounting angle, uh, angle um, the best configuration? We were, we were curious to see about that. And also uh, rotation rates, so how fast the laser scanner is rotating, um, vessel speed we can control with the simulator. We can even introduce a little bit of vessel motion caused by wave activity, so roll, pitch, and yaw. Um, factors we didn't consider in this simulation was any kind of radiometric losses uh, due to absorption and scattering of the light in the atmosphere. Also, the re reflectivity of the target, we didn't consider that at all. Um, the beam divergence of the laser, so in this simulation we're getting best case scenario, 100% of the data coming back to us. So here are the res final results of uh, a vessel passing a target at, at four knots at various ranges and various uh, uh, sensor configurations. So the left plots are with the scanner mounted 90 degrees, so vertical. Uh, the right plots is with it mounted 45 degree pitch angle forward. You can see the diagonal stripes it's making. Uh, we're starting at 10 meters and going out to 100 meters. And for this uh, setup, we're at rotating at 1200 RPM. The blue box represents the one square meter, which we use to count the number of pings inside. 
shown here, which will be shown in a, a table format in the next slide. So as I click through, we're increasing range. As you can see, the data density is decreasing as we're getting farther and farther away. This makes sense. This is 80 meters, 90 meters, and all the way out at 100 meters. This is the same set of slides, except now we're rotating at 300 RPM. So the vertical spacing here of the, of the points is a lot closer. Again, as I click through, we're going to be increasing in range. 50 meters. And you got 100 meters. This is the tabular results of, of this simulator. Like I said, we can uh, see an obvious uh, inverse relationship between the, the ping number, the points within the box, and the range to the target. So as the scanner is getting further from the target, we're getting less points, and that's due to an inverse square relationship. We can also see that the oblique scans are, for some reason, getting a lot more pings inside the box relative to the vertical scan configurations. And we're, we're pretty sure that's because just the physical shape of the box. Um, the, or, the, with it mounted 45 degrees forward, we got about 1.4 times more than with it mounted vertically. That's just because, like I said, the physical shape of the uh, target hypotenuse of the 45, 45, 90 triangles squared to two, roughly 1.4. So that explains that. Uh, so to compare the simulated results with real world results, we collected the data set out um, at the UNH peer face. Here is our target of interest. It's a vertical, relatively flat, smooth surface, um, easily um, easily identified in the data set because we had a lot, not a lot of nice features on the, the pier, these bollards here and these vertical rub rails. Uh, so we collected lines of data mimicking the same configurations we had in the simulation. So from 10 to 100 meters at these various different sensor configurations. Here's a picture of the scanner mounted on the flying bridge of the RV Gulf Surveyor. Uh, vertical mount, so the bow of the boat is here to the left. And here's with it mounted with a 45 degree pitch forward. For processing, I, I manually cleaned out all of the data that were uh, outside of this box. So we're just looking in between the rub rails here. Um, imported the data into MATLAB and to align the one square meter box with the data, I calculated the plane of best fit using least squares approximation and then used that normal vector to rotate the data to align with the one square meter box. And that's what we use to count the points uh, within that box. So here's the type of the results from the field validation. Um, you can still see the inverse relationship between uh, point count and range. Um, you're getting a lot more variability uh, for a specific range to the target. Uh, see down 900 here and 1,300 points in that configuration. That's due to vessel motion, we're thinking. So as we're passing by the target, this was done in Portsmouth Harbor, which has kind of squirrely currents. Uh, so it's kind of hard to maintain the boat at that specific four knot speed. And also the boat is yawing back and forth. So that, that's explaining this high variation. But to, in an attempt to compare these field validation results with the, the simulator, I calculated the percent errors, so experimental versus uh, theoretical. And uh, so lower values here in this table represent a, a, a closer match to, to uh, the theoretical. And as you can see, we have some, some uh, strong players here at 20 meter range, 300 RPMs. We had close match with experimental versus theoretical. Out in the oblique side, uh, the best match we got was about 11%. So the reasons why we, we don't get a good comparison here, especially at farther ranges, was because in the simulator, we weren't, like I said before, we weren't accounting for any radiometric loss. So uh, scattering, um, we weren't accounting for reflectance of the target, the beam footprint. Um, also, we didn't introduce any vessel motion in the simulator. So that wasn't accounted for either. In the uh, experimental, we had a lot of vessel motion to deal with. So to summarize the instrument characterization that, that we did, uh, had a 
showed you the results from an internal reference frame validation. We saw that we observed a maximum offset of a tenth of a degree uh, with an associated uncertainty of six hundredths of a degree. Uh, we then looked at the range uncertainties and saw that at least within 30 meters, we had a range uncertainty of about plus or minus one and a half centimeters at various range, uh, at various incident angles anyway, and different targets. And then finally, we, we looked at a data density evaluation, and uh, which was only done in the strongest return mode. The scanner also has a, a dual return function. Uh, but we saw that at extremely close, ra at close ranges, we had extremely dense data of about 1,800 points per square meter. And even at farther ranges, 50 or 60 meters, we had about 400 points per square meter. So moving on to the field performance validation, uh, we mounted the scanner on the RV Gulf Surveyor and basically did a, a quick survey of the Portsmouth Harbor. I'm just going to show you some uh, point clouds resulting from that. Uh, this is whaleback light just uh, outside Portsmouth Harbor. Um, and just to correlate some features here, we have uh, some rocks just off, off of the feature here. And you can easily see them in the data set here. And these pictures were taken at the same time the, the laser data set was acquired using a DSLR camera that was triggered as we passed by. Uh, another feature here, you can easily see this was a range of about uh, 50 meters. It was 70 meters to the lighthouse. And we kind of passed a little bit further uh, uh, from the back side of this, about 95 meters. Here is Fisher's Island inside of uh, Portsmouth Harbor. This is Pepper Cove in the background. Again, just to correlate some features, we have a, a rock out here getting good coverage on. We didn't get any data on this beach back here. Um, here's the backside of uh, Whaleback Light. You can see three little rocks just barely poking above the water surface here, and they're actually kelp covered. and and getting uh, submerged and unsubmerged by the water surface. And we're still getting good data points out on those features. Again, there's some rock features out here. Uh, we passed by this US Coast Guard ship. Well, that would be interesting to show. And also the security gate here with this lattice structure. Um, at the farthest, we saw the, we didn't quite get the lattice structure here, but we were starting to pick it up once we got close enough. Uh, we saw the dock line of the ship. That was at a range of, I think, about 50 meters. Here's the uh, Memorial Bridge, the first bridge you'll come to in uh, Portsmouth Harbor. Here's with it scanned up. Here's uh, Sarah Long Bridge, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. So I can't check my numbers. That's a best result. <laughs> uh, the I-95 Bridge, which is much higher up. It's a fixed bridge, and we were still able to even get points all the way up there. Uh, the, the bottom of the bridge was 50 meters away. We were also interested to see if we can get data on overhead power cables that cross the channel. This is a back channel. This is the, the um, Navy base, Portsmouth Naval. We were able to get uh, data points on, on these kind of features also, which is really nice. Um, further up the river, north of the I-95 bridge, we have cables that are a lot taller up because we have a lot of cargo ships coming back and forth and we were even able to get good data points on this. The uh, cable diameter up there is 1.8 centimeters and it's aluminum conductor steel reinforced cable. And that was about 50 or 60 meters up. You can see the radar reflector balls, the top cables we got, but we didn't get the cable that connected those radar balls. Which leads me to a discussion point. What, what could we use the scanner for um, Additionally, so this is uh, looking at a concept of verifying air gaps. An air gap is basically the, the vertical distance between the lowest point of a target, uh, a, a feature that crosses the channel down to the water surface at a specific tidal height. So for NOAA charts, it's mean high water. Uh, that was a picture of the USS New Orleans passing under the famous Huey P. Long Bridge. <coughs> Um, which is in the southern Mississippi River, and she passed under with a margin of about 2.1 feet. So it's very, very close. This is a, a very important thing to, to be able to chart. These are the features that we surveyed, um, the overhead features that we surveyed, and we have our charted vertical clearances here uh, in meters at mean high water. 
here's our surveyed vertical clearances, again, at meters at mean high water. And the difference uh, is charted minus surveyed, so the positive numbers, meaning we surveyed a, a lower height. So it looks like we're uh, resolving some discrepancies on our, our charts here. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers have begun conducting their own surveys. They contract out using this company here using a survey grade mobile laser scanner to survey 22 different bridges in four days in the upper part of the Mississippi River. And they saw an average discrepancy of about 5.2 uh, 5 feet and a maximum discrepancy of 11.6 feet lower uh, for this specific bridge. Um, they also have plans to conduct more, more surveys in the future. They're doing two initial surveys of bridges uh, this next year. <clears throat> And they're submitting these uh, reports directly to the Coast Guard, the bridging office, the charting authority that publishes the vertical clearances for these features. And the Coast Guard is taking this information and updating their, their light lists, which allows the, the Army Corps to update their charts. <clears throat> I'd like to just acknowledge a couple of players, uh, acknowledge that the work that I did here was a part of a, a bigger work that's being conducted, high pack. Thanks, VTAD, for helping me integrate the system to the boat. They're constantly integrating this technology in new and inventive ways. Um, up at CITCO, Rabin helped me with a couple experiments down here. They're working on foresight calibration procedures up there. Uh, here at CECOM, I think we're going to continue looking at uh, characterizing the TPU for these, these kind of sensors. Uh, Coast Survey Development Lab implemented these scanners on NOAA's um, charting vessels this past year. Uh, thanks to Paul Lavoie, helped me uh, fabricate a couple of the laser scanner mounts. Um, Captain Emily Terry, Captain Ben Smith, and Dan for uh, expertly navigating the vessel. And my thesis uh, committee, and also my wife and family for their support. Questions? Very good job. Captain Amsel? So, uh, when when you uh, when you compared the uh, the simulation data density with the uh, field uh, target uh, results, it, it seemed that the the uh, differences were were greater uh, in the oblique scanning. Area and it seemed seemed to be consistently different and differed by a significant amount. Could you, well, why did you? Why would you think that might happen? Well, with an oblique scan, so the relative width of those beams as they intersect is, is going to be smaller relative to a vertical scan. So, the causes of vessel motion are probably a, a lot more predominant effect because of that. Um, it was kind of hard to interpret those data sets because of, of the vessel motion. Um, we tried to time it at slack tide, but um, obviously we can't do all that data acquisition within a narrow period of time. So we had a lot of vessel motion to consider. So, so what would your recommendation be for the for the mounting arrangement? Would you recommend the uh, forty five degree angle or the uh, I, vertical? For the simplicity of the boresight calibration procedure, currently um, we're not able to roll, uh, y'all pitch the, the sensor in that configuration without it. Those angles are dis displacements from the vessel's reference frame. So if you roll a little bit, the scanner, um, those offsets are um, translated into the other axes. So it's kind of difficult to patch that in. So it, just for ease of installation and quick uh, deployment, I would just um, suggest mounting it vertically. Okay, and uh, how many, you know, in, in that mode, uh, the, the number of actual targets, of actual hits seem to drop off uh, with range to where at one point you've got 100% difference, right? Yeah, absolutely, we didn't get any. But you also showed a number of, of field examples where you were a considerable distance. What would you what would you recommend as a as a sort of operational limit of distance for using the system for shoreline verification? So, so like an effective extinction range, like 
what how at what range is this? Can we anticipate to be able to get enough data on a target out? I would say around 60 or 70 meters, it starts to become a little scant out there. You can certainly get data at farther ranges, but it's going to be hard to interpret that, hey, that's a rock out there because you're going to only have a few points on that target, which if you uh, acquire photographs at the same time, it would be easier to interpret, or if you uh, overlays RGB values on that la uh, laser data set, you could help interpretation of that data set. But in order to get a good amount of data on, I would say 60 to 70 meters. So my questions are also along the same line as the Armstrong. So as far as I know, these units are being used in NOAA vessels right now. So what is their, their yeah. mounting angles? That's what I'm wondering. Like, do they mount, mount vertically or people? They're mounting them vertically. They followed uh, some guidance from the Army Corps and, and developed a, a, a mounting bracket that's on top of the, um, the overhead of, of the survey vessel, and they're mounting it vertically. I'm not sure if they've actually welded those mounts in place yet. They were kind of just strapping them in temporarily to, to see how they were working. And but I, I believe they moved forward with that. So would you recommend to change to all the angle, horizontal angle? No, I think I think I haven't seen it in action yet, but I, I have no reason to suspect that it is not working well. Another question I have. So when you talked about the data density, so what is the Practical data density you get in real life in survey conditions, or what is the minimum number of data to survey to for like feature detection? What is the minimum amount of points I would need on a target? <coughs> yeah. I guess it depends on the target type, right? If it's a, if it's a rock that's barely poking above the water surface, I would want a lot more points on that relative to like a vertical pier, where if they were a little bit scattered, uh, a little bit less dense, um, I could still determine that that was a a planar target, a vertical planar target. Um, ironically, you're going to get a lot more data on that vertical surface, and probably a le uh, less data on the on the rock. So, um, but within fifty to one hundred points, probably. And at fifty meters, like uh, we, we saw with the field results of the data density analysis, we were getting about four hundred points per square meter. Again, that was a vertical target so it's kind of best case scenario but thank you so again continuing on the same uh, operational level first how to, uh, first steps how do you see it mounted and unmounted from vessels do you need to do a calibration based on the results of your study at least a rough foresight calibration yeah we don't need to get to hundreds of a degree alignment um, the calibration process I used was basically driving a box around a day board, a fixed day board outside of Portsmouth Harbor and using the geometry of the vessel and, and the day board, able to uh, adjust the, the scanner that way. So it wasn't, you know, hundreds of a degree accurate, but it was certainly good enough, especially to meet IHO spec. Okay. And then after collecting the data, how do you think of interrogating the data? You talked about kelp and you talked about uh, the specular targets. Mm -hmm. So you might lose at angles. So how, following what Ferrat asked about the number of points, do you see any kind of logging done on the field, or it's just post processing based on just the point cloud you, you have available? So the current use of these scanners in the field, how I interpret it is, or how I've been told, is that they're acquiring data points real time. So as you see this point cloud come come in. They're looking outside the boat. They see that's a rock out there, and they correlate it with the rock feature in the real-time point cloud. HiPack has a function where you can query that target and get the least depth on that target, which is outputted to a triple zero file directly. So it's currently they're not doing any post-processing with this data set. So it's not really adding any post-processing time in the, the back end. Last question here, and this is an extrapolating from your study going forward. What happens when you have multiple surveys over the same area? Do you see them fitting well with each other, or do you get some some boresight or some other uh, issues going on? So the better your boresight calibration angles are and, and integration to the survey vessel, the, the tighter comparison you're, you're going to get. Yeah. Um, your field measurements, how did they? They, they matched up well, especially the the pier face um, running different lines at different ranges and stuff with the right boresight calibration angles. They matched up well. Open to the public. 
It is a lot, actually. Um, if if the, the sensor face is pointed directly at the sun, you're going to get a lot of blowout because of it's just saturating the sensor. So you'll get, um, I should have had um, an image showing this, but big wedge of data going up towards the sun, which is pretty easy to clean out, right? It's The data isn't usually behind a feature. So if we were going surveying a bridge and the sun was behind the bridge, that would be problematic. You kind of have to think about that when you're out in the field, how you run your lines. Does the amount of sunlight on a target affect the number of returns coming back in the accuracy? Um, I didn't look at that specifically. I would think, unless the, the target itself was a specular target like the water surface, then yeah, that would definitely affect the, the scanner. But if it, the target uh, scatters the sunlight enough, and it shouldn't very well affect it. But you can elaborate what happens when it saturates the, the sensor because you saw the results of what offset you saw. Yeah, so when I scan the aluminum target, uh, which is really bright target at uh, normal incident angles, I saw a really saturated intensity return coming back to me, which also registered as a, a closer range, probably because the digital signal processing it, it's picking a point that I'm not sure how they. Uh, detect or choose the point for the range if it's the peak of the intensity or if it's some other point but we saw a range artifact due to a uh, saturation yeah. well I have a few questions <laughs> uh, one of them, uh, I don't get to pick the people asking questions next uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned that uh, it's more important to look at the shallow uh, rocks rather than the vertical uh, wall, right? Uh, and that suggests that uh, it would be better to uh, uh, mount it uh, obliquely, right? So if you mount it obliquely, then you have better look at the shallow uh, rocks uh, and uh, uh, the same uh, look at the vertical uh, uh, wall. If you uh, mount it vertically, you have less points looking at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, rocks. So, and that means that uh, maybe it is still better, even though calibration is more difficult. It is, you are getting more information with uh, the uh, oblique uh, mount, uh, mounting of the sensor. That's the first thing. Second, uh, how the, do you know how uh, the weather conditions affect the range measurement? Because I can imagine that uh, light is propagating differently in rain. And third, uh, you have a, a, a rotating part, mechanically rotating part, and that means vibration. Yes. Uh, what, is it affecting anything or vibration is negligible? I'll let you answer my order or I mean, <laughs> I'll go. I'll go inverse, I guess. So for the vibration, I there probably is effects of the vibration. So for the angular uncertainty and offset measurements that I did, I only did at one specific azimuth. So maybe doing an assessment of different azimuths would kind of shed some light on if there's a vibration issue going on. I, I suspect there is some vibration. I mean, when you hold that unit in your hand and it's spinning, you feel it. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there's probably effects of that in there. Um, yeah, I'll go back. You, you did not investigate how this affects the I didn't. accuracy of measurements. I didn't, no. The, scope. the weather uh, component, yes. Uh, like in Matt's uh, discussion, he said, you know, if you fly ALB surveys when it's foggy out, you're not going to get very good data. You might not get any data back because the light um, refra uh, reflects off all the water particles in the atmosphere and absorption. So in, in heavy rain, I would definitely wouldn't suggest conducting these operations. Uh, the fair weather uh, collected some data in Alaska, which it's always nasty weather. Um, and they were able to get penetration through a, a light fog. So it, it's possible, but I would definitely try to shoot for nice sunny days. Sure, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, when the weather is not nice, it's not worth even 
I guess that's an operational consideration, right? If you have to go tomorrow and this is the only day you have to acquire the data, you're going to do it, right? But if you can wait a week, it'd be better to wait. And for the the mounting angle, I'm not sure if we I got the geometry right. So when you're mounted vertically on the boat, this is the scanner. We're scanning 360 degrees this way. The the 45 degree pitch forward. I guess I'm doing like oh, a John Hughes no, Clark I, dance I, up here. I, I, but. I, 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 uh, uh, so, so, so suppose you are uh, mounting it vertically. And it uh, rotates uh, like uh, around. That's like that. horizontal. Yeah. Very so, okay, horizontal. So, but if you mount it uh, with some angle, it looks more. I uh, I agree. So the higher up the 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 lower the incident angle will be, the better chance you have on getting some returns off of that target. Absolutely. But that relates to the height of the mounting from the vessel. And doing now we have the, the John Hughes Club dance. If when you're scanning and you're starting to move forward, so you will hit that target, it depends on your speed. So you, yeah. if there's some impetus, you will slow down from that to get more density along the horizontal line. Okay. Captain Brennan? So, to follow on with Yuri's question, I'm curious if, if most of the commercial sensors out now, they actually have two, yep. and they're, they're oriented. So any, any thoughts on, on the value of that, particularly to get it in the coming and the going? Direction mounting both, yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Two, in one, two, two of those Velodynes in one installation. So, if you mount it in different con, uh, configurations, you would you approach on uh, the target from one side, you would get coverage on the other uh, on that side. If you go back around it, if the other scanner was pointing in the other direction, absolutely, you would get data on the, the back side of it. These survey grade ones usually only have one laser, so that's I think that's why they usually implement it that way. Right. Yeah, I, I just wasn't sure if the fact that you had multiple doesn't, you know, doesn't you gives you the same effect. Yeah, exactly. The angles that they're rotating at are, are much greater, and so you're getting them at, at a much different, significantly different angles than just. Uh, you know. And we have 16 different beams, right? So if we're going under a bridge and we're mounting, uh, we're scanning vertically, the plus or minus 15 degree beams above us is going to look something like this. So the forward beam is going to scan the bridge from this direction. When we go under the bridge, the back beam is going to scan the other side of the bridge. So it kind of gets around that. You showed an equation in the beginning uh, to go from the reference frame of the moving platform to the stationary platform. I think that's valid only for stationary uh, platforms moving at a constant velocity. So if your IMU does output accelerations, you can extend that. And the reason I'm mentioning this, you can improve the numbers on the chart on table 31, because now you mentioned it was difficult to keep the boat at a constant velocity, you know, when it's, you know, being hit with waves and so forth. It's, it's quite easy to extend that equation uh, to include uh, the changing uh, parameters. Well, will you include that in the rotating method? Yeah, yeah, so you can, you can add it. Think, think about the launch. If you're trying to go at a constant velocity, everything's valid. But if you're accelerating or decelerating, that's a source of error because you're not accounting for those that change. And you showed that on the chart on page on slide 31. You said there was a wide discrepancy among the values. You know, uh, yeah, there's the equation at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And you can extend that to include uh, accelerations if your IMU outputs it. That's just, you know, something to consider. You don't have to do that. Right. So, I, so uh, you listed your angular uncertainties in the context of the total allowable horizontal, uh, but that was only for the laser. As far as the other contributions to the total yeah. propagated uncertainty, what does it say about the requirements for the positioning of the vessel? Um, and angular alignments and lever arm accuracies and those kinds of things. Did you consider those at all? Not, no, that was just purely sensor contributions of that uncertainty. Obviously, the, the end coordinate of that target is going to have components from uncertainties from a various source of various sources, like the, the foresight calibration, the, the vessel, um, the offset survey. So that was just from that one component. Do you think our typical offset surveys would be accurate? I, know. I think so, yeah. What about positioning of the vessel? 
Oh, certainly positioning the vessel. We did collect with RTK and for that data set, so yeah. Yeah, definitely your ass. Well, I have a question from the internet and our own Scott Rancher. I think that you probably touched on the answer to this and a couple of the other questions, but um, taking a step back and more of a general question, um, Scott's asking what you think the biggest impediment to the use of these systems as a common mapping tool might be. Well, previously it was the cost, right? I mean, we just couldn't justify the cost. So now that these sensors are really affordable, this unit was only $8,000. That's It's really to scoop it up, implement it on the boat, and start to use it. So, And we've seen that. All, all of our OCS vessels now, I think, all have them and are being implemented now. There's a lot of plans for other people to use it here at SeaCom. The ASV people plan on using it for target detection and avoidance, and they're, they're very popular nowadays. And just to elaborate more, Vitad and I, back in the day, were discussing the different options and about $100 and even $50 LiDAR system, but the ones on the range of $6,000 to $12,000, you have like free, on your free at the moment that I'm aware of, that meet these requirements. And, and actually, Velodyne was the most forward uh, going here with HIPAC, giving some proprietary knowledge, which allowed it to inter integrate it, which allows it to implement it in the ships. Yeah, I was just going to ask about like the shadowing effect of the laser beam. So like some of the rock detection you're trying to do, a lot of the feature was shadowed. Is that going to like hinder your ability to map those features? Or do you have, you're just going to have to do laps around them? So it's a cartographic question, right? We're, we're trying to ultimately pick the highest point of that rock. So if the laser intersects, if the highest point of that rock that later intersects it and you get a data point on that, on that Point, then we've achieved what we were trying to do. But if there's a higher point on the back side that's blocked by the, the, the front, it is, you're not going to get data on it. So, yeah, that, that would be a consideration now. That's kind of a cartographic side of things. Last question? Wow. Okay. <laughs> My first one, one is <laughs> or maybe I missed it, but you, you measured the horizontal effect of a beam pointing angle. But did you also measure the vertical effect as you had it? mounted like how well their encoder is for positioning the beam i didn't get to that no and like you just said it has a, an azimuth encoder so it registers when it passes a certain point and i didn't look at that no and, and my second question was uh your images of the data are beautiful, are beautiful. um how much cleaning did they do yeah how, <laughs> how painful is that how much the sort of volume of data like compared to what we're used to with sonar systems and and uh and how much calling did you have to do what was supposed that like it's it can be a lot of data um in high pack you have the ability to disable certain beams so if you only wanted to acquire with one beam you could um the scanner has a dual return mode so you can be collecting twice the amount of data which high pack seems to be choking on right now anyway it, it slows down a lot um as far as cleaning, uh, like I said, with the, the blowout from the sun, it's, it's usually easy to, to find and clean out. It's just a quick swipe and it's gone. Um, even the returns off of the water surface, as the sun bounces off the water up to the scanner, you'll get a, a streak of data that are below the water surface and it's easy to clean out. If you're passing boats and they're like stemming with you, you'll get a streak of data off of the port side. Um, you just kind of have to be cognizant of what's going on out there. And like I said, Noah's finding uh, or querying the data out in the field real time. So they're not actually needing to post process it as of yet. So. So thank you again to John.